Well, tonight we have um, for our Montgomery Amateur Radio Club presentation, Bob, AK3Y, who's going to talk to us about the Nano NVA and some of its many uses in the ham shack. So Bob is a member of our club and has been at an active ham since 1965. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University and was elected fellow of the IEEE for his work in short pulse electromagnetics. Bob enjoys home brewing and is very active on HF, VHF and satellites. So we're very happy to have Bob. And so Bob, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Let me uh, hit my share screen. Uh, whoop. You know, thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, Apple. It looks like I need to um, allow privilege to do this. Let me sure. There we go. Hopefully this works. Okay, does everybody see the screen? I do. Okay, good, good. Yeah, the, the new uh, Apple operating system requires you to okay absolutely every single thing that you do. So <laughs> apparently I had not done that yet. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Alex, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, the topic tonight is going to be about the uh, Nano VNA, the Nano Vector Network Analyzer. And uh, I gave a presentation somewhat similar to this about a year ago, uh, WB2U. Um, uh, Vic had uh, got together uh, probably about a dozen or so hams and we went through this, but uh, this is a, uh, an extended version of that presentation and I wanted to do this to give you a better idea of the uh, many types of things you, you can do with the nano VNA, other than simply just measuring your antennas SWR. Uh, it seems like people get into it initially because they want to find a uh, inexpensive way of measuring standing wave ratio, but the uh, Nano is uh, quite a spectacular piece of instrumentation. And uh, I hope by the end of the presentation, you'll believe that uh, for a hundred bucks or less, uh, this is something you want to add to your repertoire of, uh, of tools in, in your own shack. So the... Um, the outline of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit of, about uh, what are called endport linear networks, because that's the basic idea behind uh, the uh, techniques by which the nano measures uh, all its parameters. We'll talk a little bit about scattering parameters uh, for uh, things uh, that are called S parameters or uh, measurements of reflection uh, coefficients that uh, exist on transmission lines and why that's important. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, uh, hardware architecture for the Nano VNA, how it's built and uh, what it, it, what it uh, uses to try to make these measurements. Uh, a brief touching of the Smith chart basics because uh, that's gonna come in handy when we talk a little bit about matching networks and uh, a few other uh, characterizations of of devices like amplifiers and uh, filter responses. And then we're gonna go through a bunch of different applications for the Nano. Uh, the first one, you know, as I mentioned, measuring antennas, and you can see here the list is quite extensive, uh, all the way down to uh, measuring radiation patterns on antennas, uh, looking for faults in transmission lines, using it as a grid dip oscillator for all these old timers like myself that remember what a grid is. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, things like uh, crystal ladder, ladder filters, how do you design those? Lots of different things you can do with this little device that you may not have thought of. So what is an endport linear network? Uh, the, um, the basic concept is that there are a, a set of ports or input and output uh, devices that uh, we'd like to measure the characteristics of by applying a signal to the uh, one port. Uh, let me see if I can get uh, my pen working here. There we go. So we're gonna look at uh, what happens uh, of a signal going into uh, one port and maybe coming out of another one or maybe even coming out of the same port itself. And uh, you'll see why that's important uh, in the way the nano VNA makes its measurements. Uh, a one port network, a very simple one port network is something like a resistor. 
So resistor has a gazinta, but no gazada. <laughs> there's, there's an input waveform that I can put into it and I can measure things across it, but there's nothing that's coming back that I can measure or something coming out of another port, for example, that I can measure. So uh, it only has one input and uh, that input is also the same as its output. Filters, uh, for example, if I have a, uh, an LC filter or an RC filter, I'm gonna have an input and then I'm gonna have another output from that filter. And that's called a two port network. End port networks and multi-port networks are things like diplexers, duplexers, directional couplers, combiners, things like that, where I, I can have one input and many outputs, one, out, uh, one uh, output and many inputs to it, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, those are the types of networks that the uh, vector, network, uh, vetwork, yeah, vector network analyzer is gonna be looking at. Um, in general, when I have a two port network or an end port network, I have a set of equations that characterize it. And they're normally written as a, a matrix. So for example, the voltages at uh, port one and the voltage at port two are related to the currents at port one and the currents at port two by this matrix equation or in linear terms, V1 is equal to Z11 times I1, et cetera, et cetera. These uh, individual components are complex numbers. And the reason they're complex is kind of an interesting um, uh, discussion all in itself. And if we have some time, I'll go into a little bit more detail why all these parameters are complex. But suffice it to say that we have to worry about things like not only magnitude, but also phase responses. And anytime you have a magnitude and phase, you basically have a vector, which is a complex uh, entity, and by expressing the inputs and outputs in terms of these complex quantities, you can get uh, the response of the network to, to anything that you apply to it. Okay, another uh, type of, um, of parameterization of a, a network is uh, through the use of scattering parameters. In the previous uh, uh, one, I talked about impedance parameters. So for example, the voltage is related to the current by the impedance value. So for example, V1 is related to the current that's fed into the first port by this impedance number Z11, which is a complex number. But in general, um, I can also measure not just impedances, but I can measure things like admittances and all kinds of other parameters. One of them that's very important is what is called scattering parameters. And what a scattering parameter is, is the measurement of the amount of energy that is passed through a device, but also the amount of energy that's passed back from the device. So for example, if I apply a signal to a, a particular port, A1 here, this is an optical version of the scattering parameters, this incident uh, waveform or the incident light beam in this case, A1, passes through the lens and goes to the output. So this is one path, but it also can reflect off this first surface and give you reflective value B1. And the same thing true of a, a LC network. Uh, when I apply a, a amount of energy to one port, I also get some energy coming back from that port that's in terms of a reflection and also energy which is passed through the device which is, uh, can be measured on the other ports that are attached to the, to the uh, system. So the, uh, the type of um, equations that the network analyzer deals with are these where S11, S12, S21, and S22 are called the complex scattering coefficients. And they represent the ratio of the transmitted energy to the received energy uh, or the transmitted energy to the reflected energy, depending on which one I'm looking at, um, as a function of the port that I'm looking at. So this, this is the most complicated drawing I'm gonna have, and it's gonna be a lot easier from here, but the way to measure these is that if, if I look at a transmission line, a coaxial cable, you'll, you'll remember that if I attach a impedance to a a, a transmission line that matches its characteristic impedance. So for example, if I have a, a 50 ohm piece of RG8 or RG213 
or a 75 ohm piece of RG59, and I attach a 50 ohm load to the 50 ohm impedance uh, coaxial cables, or a 75 ohm uh, 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 impedance to the 75 ohm cable. If I pass energy down that transmission line, nothing gets reflected back. It all gets absorbed in the load. And that's the property of the characteristic impedance of that transmission line. So what's nice about uh, scattering parameters, if I apply a load impedance to the output of a port, then it's easy to calibrate because if I put a characteristic impedance that's exactly the value of the transmission line value of, of Z naught, then there's gonna be zero coming back. So it's a very nice way of determining whether or not I've got balance or not in my, in my line. So uh, let me go a little bit more into um, how you measure this. So the vector network analyzer consists of a, a number of couplers, directional couplers. And those directional couplers allow you to uh, put energy into the coupler and measure the energy coming out of the coupler or energy, that, energy that's passed from one coupler to another through a second port. The way it's done, for example, in uh, SWR bridges, here's a, a, a schematic version of a Heathkit SWR bridge from the 1960s. And here's a piece of transmission line, which uh, is connected between the input and output. So my, my transmitter is on this end and my receiver is on this end, or, or my antenna, I should say, is on this end. And I transmit energy through that. Some of the energy gets coupled in through this inductive coupling here between the transmission line and another piece of wire which is then fed to a, a diode rectifier circuit to measure the voltage. And this measures the forward amount of current or forward amount of voltage that's present on that, on that transmission line. And on the other end of the coax, there is another diode, which it, it receives the reflected energy that may come back from the load. And by measuring the ratio of these two, I can get the standing wave ratio. The problem with this is that it's purely scalar. In other words, there's no phase information that's given here. Uh, I get an absolute value of the voltage. I get an absolute value of both the reflected and transmitted voltages. And the ratio of those absolute values gives me the standing wave ratio. I can't measure impedances. I can't measure angles, et cetera, et cetera. And it's useful for SWR, but that's about as far as it goes. In the microwave world, people use what are called strip line couplers, very similar to this design. Uh, here I have a piece of strip line instead of a coaxial cable, uh, 50 ohm strip line. Uh, the, uh, another piece of strip line, which is coupling to that on one side, another piece on the other side. On this, on this end, um, I receive the transmitted voltage because I'm picking it up here and all the rest of it gets buried in this load. And the same thing true on this other end, this re receives all the reflected energy. So if I can measure amplitude and phase here, then I could measure uh, the S parameters that I'm looking at. Well, this is fairly complex. The problem with the strip line couplers is they're usually very narrow band. So uh, they're not typically used in uh, these type of very simple network analyzers. But there's one device that I think a lot of us are maybe familiar with uh, are called Wheatstone bridges. And what a Wheatstone bridge is, is a balanced uh, load uh, or a balanced configuration, I should say, of resistors. Here are two resistors here, 50 ohms and 450 ohms. And then there's a ratio of 10 to one or so, 5.5 to another. And if these, if the uh, ratio of these two resistors is uh, on the left-hand side is equal to the ratio of these two resistors on the right-hand side, then no current flows through this in, in center resistor. If there's any imbalance there because this resistance here is different, then that ratio would, would demand, then there's gonna be some current flowing through there. And it turns out, if you work out the mathematics of this, that the voltage that is present across this resistor here is proportional, directly proportional to the scattering parameter. So it turns out that in the vector network analyzer, I've got a set of Wheatstone bridges that are used for measuring the uh, S parameters. The advantage of the Wheatstone bridges are is that they are extremely wideband, multiple gigahertz. And that's why for 50 or 100 bucks, you can buy a network analyzer that can go up to five to six gigahertz. Uh, you couldn't do that with these other, other types of devices.
So what can you do with S parameters? Uh, the S11 parameter is a measure of the amount of energy that's reflected back from the port. If you look at that parameter S11, the 20 log of that S11 is what's called a return loss. In other words, it's the amount of loss that's entailed by the waveform as it propagates down the transmission line and comes back to you. So it's a measure of coaxial cable loss or a measure of system loss. The standing wave ratio can be calculated from this relationship. So one plus the magnitude of S11 over one minus the magnitude of S11 is a standing wave ratio. Note that there's no phase information here. In other words, the magnitude gets rid of the phase information on S11. And that's why that Heathkit, Heathkit bridge can be really, really simple. You don't need to measure phase to measure standing wave ratio. Same thing true with system gain. If I have an amplifier, I can measure what's a, known as S21. Now S21 is the measurement that's obtained when I have one port here, which is the input port, another port, which is the output port, and I measure the energy that transmits through this. So S21 is the amount of energy that is present on port two, given the energy at port one. So that, as you can see, is actually the gain of that system. S11 is the amount of energy that's reflected back from port one. So the numbers here, two and one, and, and, and uh, you could have S67, for example, if you have a seven port network, S21 represents the relationship of port two to port one. S11 represents the relationship of port one to port one. So in other words, it's the reflection that comes back. The thing that's probably most useful is I can measure the impedance of a device by looking at the S parameters. In other words, there's a very uh, close relationship between the S parameter and the actual impedance of a circuit. And this is what Smith discovered. Uh, Smith, and that's where the Smith chart comes from, uh, was a researcher that was trying to come up with a simple way of representing impedances along a transmission line. And what he found was that this relationship here, which is a very nonlinear relationship, would be uh, can be used to very simply. If I could plot this on a on a, it, it turns out to be a circle. If you look at this carefully, you'll see that the magnitude is uh, going to be a, a plus one. It can't get any higher than one. It can't get any uh, lower than minus one. Uh, it turns out that this particular relationship is what transforms the impedance to the S parameters and vice versa. The S parameters can be gotten from the impedance by this relationship. So these two relationships are the fundamentals that are used by the network analyzers to determine literally all the parameters of your linear system. Okay, so let me, what is the difference again between a, the network analyzer and a, a, just a standard an, antenna analyzer? Antenna analyzers, for example, the Rig Expert uh, AA600, I think there's some later ones now, uh, only measure one port. Uh, in other words, you apply an antenna to one port and it measures amplitude and phase at that port. So in a sense, it measures S11. It doesn't give you more information about it. It'll give you amplitude and phase. The vector network analyzer is a two port device and it allows you to measure the uh, things which have more than a single port, filters, uh, transistors, transmission lines, um, and a number of other things. And we'll see that as we go along. There's uh, more information about the network analyzers here. I'm gonna make a copy of this presentation also available on my, uh, my personal website, so you can download all this information as well. And there's some more references at the end. The thing that's amazing about these devices is they're, they're well under $100, and uh, you'll see why they become very useful. Uh, how, how are these built? Well, it's actually very, very simple. The, the Wheatstone Bridge is the whole basic uh, concept behind measuring reflections. So energy comes in, or comes out in this case, it's transmitted from this port. It comes into this port um, from the device under test and it's uh, mixed to a, an IF frequency that is then processed. In this case, it's interesting, it's mixed right down to audio. 
and it's processed by an audio signal processor. To make, to make this very, very inexpensive, it uses a very low cost audio codec. And that audio codec is controlled by a uh, Cortex uh, 48 megahertz uh, signal processing chip. And uh, the whole basic behind the frequency uh, uh, generation of this device is done with a uh, SI5351 chip. So the SI5351 generates signals uh, uh, up to a couple hundred megahertz, actually to 300 megahertz, this is wrong here, should be about 300 megahertz. And uh, it uh, uses the Wheatstone bridge to measure the reflections coming back. Now, it turns out that how do I get higher on some of these low cost nano VNAs, uh, the uh, SI5351 output is actually multiplied. It's multiplied by two, by three, and I think by five to get you up to 1.5 gigahertz, and uh, sometimes higher than that to get up to three gigahertz. Uh, but uh, in general, there's a Wheatstone bridge that measures the reflections. There is a, uh, a voltage-controlled oscillator, which uh, determines the frequency sweep. There is a set of down converters, which are very simple uh, double-balanced mixers. Uh, a audio signal processor and a microcontroller that controls the audio processor and the, uh, also controls the display. Very, very simple concept, and that's why they're so inexpensive. Let's talk a little bit about Smith charts and, and how they work. Remember I mentioned that there's a relationship between the S parameter. Now, S parameters are measure the amount of energy that's reflected. So if, if S11 is exactly zero, and then and S11 is also referred to as gamma. If S11 is exactly zero, I get no reflection. I'm in the center of the Smith chart. So gamma equals zero corresponds to a load which is exactly equal to the characteristic impedance. In this case, I pick a 50 ohm load. It could be 75, it could be 300. The Smith chart is all referenced to your normalized impedance. So for example, if I have a 300 ohm uh, system, uh, say twin lead system that I wanna look at, I can normalize everything to 300 ohms and still use the same Smith chart. Uh, 50 ohms, I just divide everything by 50. So for example, if I have a um, impedance that looks like this, I, I have a 50 ohms uh, resistor and a 227 puff capacitor, and I wanna make some measurements at seven megahertz, well, it turns out that this gives me an impedance of 50 minus J 100 ohms. And in order to find its location on the Smith chart, I divide this impedance by the characteristic impedance of my transmission line. In this case, it's 50 ohms. So I end up with a number which is one plus J two. I look for one on the Smith chart, which is, um, uh, right here, this is this this curve here, which is one, and then two is this curve going through this direction, and the intersection of these two curves is this point here, which represents that impedance. From the Smith chart, I can get a bunch of different things out. I can find the the angle that that corresponds to, which is forty five degrees, and uh, you can see that there's going to be a forty five degree phase shift here. Uh, it's very useful for looking at uh, characteristic impedances or impedances in general, I should say. Uh, there are three specific points on the Smith chart that are very important and they'll come in handy when you're trying to look at the nano VNA. The center point of the Smith chart is where everything is normalized to zero. In other words, the gamma or the, the S parameter is exactly zero. There's no reflections or the impedance is exactly 50 ohms. At the right-hand end of the Smith chart, the impedance is infinity. So gamma goes up to one. As Z goes to infinity in this equation, you can see that the S11 parameter goes to unity. When Z goes to zero, um, you, you can see that uh, this goes to minus one. So if Z is zero in this equation, I get minus Z zero over Z zero or a minus one. So at a short circuit, I have a reflection coefficient of minus one. At a open circuit, I got a reflection coefficient of plus one. And when everything is normalized to 50 ohms, if I attach a 50 ohm resistor to my circuit, I get no reflection. So let's look at a, a transmission line for a second. Here's a piece of coax. And I put a single source on this end. And if I terminate this in 50 ohms, I get no reflection coming back. So the energy comes out this way, it gets totally dissipated by the 50 ohm resistance. 
and nothing gets reflected back. But on the other hand, if I have the same coaxial cable and I leave the one end open, what happens? Well, the energy goes down the coaxial cable. It's got no place to go. Uh, there's no way it's going to dissipate energy, any energy here. The energy has to go somewhere. It's, it's either going to arc over because there's a huge voltage there uh, or it's going to bounce back. And so what happens is if I have an open circuit, 100% of the, re of the transmitted energy gets reflected back. In other words, the reflection coefficient is plus one. Plus one represents 100% of the transmitted energy getting reflected back. Short circuit, if I make this a short here and send the signal down the tr transmission line, all the energy gets shorted out here, but it's, uh, there's no dissipation, right? Because there's zero ohms, there's no energy loss. Uh, the, the current can get extremely high, the voltage goes to zero, but there's no place for that current to go except to come back again. And it turns out that the phase flips 100 degrees, 180 degrees, and the waveform that comes back is 180 degrees out of phase with the waveform that I sent. In other words, gamma equals minus one. The entire set of energy that's transmitted down the coaxial line is transmitted back to the, to the transmitter, flipped 180 degrees in phase. Obviously, these are really bad points to be working an antenna, right? you know, because you're going to see uh, an infinite SWR in each one of these cases. Uh, here is where you want to operate. The closer you are to zero, we'll see the better off you're going to be in terms of, uh, of the uh, standing wave ratio. Now, the way the, the vector network analyzer is then calibrated is exactly the same way. I put an open circuit on the nano VNA and I measure the response. It better be 100% coming back. If it's not, then I have to adjust the parameters just slightly so that the Smith chart lands, the point uh, it lands exactly here on the Smith chart. If I put a 50 ohm load on the uh, network analyzer, it better land in this, at the center. If it doesn't land in the center, then I have to adjust the parameters of the vector network analyzer so it does. And the same thing true for here. That's why you end up with what's called a short open load calibration, SOL. You apply a short circuit, which uh, puts you here on the Smith chart. You apply an open circuit, which puts you on the right hand end of the Smith chart. And then you put a load, which pops you right at the center of the Smith chart. And that's why you'll see the, the letters S-O-L. Sometimes you'll see the letter T, S-O-L-T, which stands for through. And that corresponds to having two ports. In other words, not only do I calibrate for one of the ports, but I also calibrate for the through port. And we'll see that in, in a few minutes. What else is important about the Smith chart? The closer you are to the center of the Smith chart, the smaller your standing wave ratio. So the ideal situation is that what you'll find is in many cases, you'll find an antenna which looks something like this. You'll make a measurement and you'll see the antenna looks like this. And you can, you can really look directly on this Smith chart. You'll know exactly what the standing wave ratio is. And what you wanna do is somehow move this curve down to the center. And we'll see ways of doing that using the vector network analyzer. Um, if you want to operate, for example, an 80 meter antenna on 160 meters, it's a piece of cake if you know the S parameters. Okay, so I think I, I mentioned that already. Here's, for example, my my NFED, uh, my 80 through 10 meter NFED that I've got up in the air. It's a myantennas.com antenna. And uh, I looked at the response of that NFED between 13 and 15 megahertz. And you can see what happens is as I get close, closer and closer to the uh, 20 meter band, I, I end up with, with, cur with uh, values of my S parameter, which lie very, very close to the origin or through the center, I should say. And if you look at here, this is a plot, it's, it's a little tiny thing here, but you'll see this is a standing wave ratio corresponding to that. You can see the standing wave ratio takes a dip right at the center. And so this uh, shows that this particular antenna works very, very well on 20 meters. 
So the, the calibration we talked about, we uh, align it by applying, uh, and there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos, by the way, that show you how to align your uh, vector network analyzer. I'm not gonna go through that in any detail, and you'll find just dozens and dozens of videos on that. But suffice it to say, the reason for doing that at all is to normalize the Smith chart. When you first turn the vector network analyzer on, you may find that a short circuit looks something like this, an open circuit looks something like this, and the center looks something like this versus frequency. Well, that's all screwed up. You wanna be able to calibrate it so that regardless of what frequency you're measuring, the short is always here, the load is always in the center, and the open is always there. Once you've done that, then all your measurements are gonna be very, very accurate. Let me skip this. this. We'll come back to this. These are just steps for calibrating. Uh, I want to go through what we can use this for, and we'll come back to this if we have to. Okay, I talked a little bit about measuring antennas. Uh, there are a couple ways of, of doing that. Uh, one of them, them is to simply measure S11, and S11 is measured by attaching the antenna to the one port on the vector network analyzer, calibrating it for the frequency range of interest. In this case, I calibrated it from 144 to 148 megahertz. And I do that by uh, setting the sweep on the network analyzer to 144 to 148, going through a short open load test on it. So I apply a short circuit to the port, I apply a load to it and I apply an open circuit to it and I make a measurement. The network analyzer calibrates all that out and now I can measure the, uh, the uh, reflection coefficient for this particular antenna. This is an M squared LeoPAC uh, satellite antenna, 144 megahertz. And you can see it's got a very, very good response on the low end of the band, which is where it was designed for. As you start getting up higher in frequency, you see that the SWR starts to approach uh, three to one. Uh, that's the, just the way it was designed. Okay, this is um, another interesting approach uh, for using the uh, network analyzer. Let's say I want to build a, a, a matching network for an NFED antenna. This is a 49 to 1 transformer, again, from myantennas.com. And a 49 to 1 transformer will take a 50 ohm impedance and raise it to roughly 2,400 ohms. So it's 50 times the 49 ratio. So it's roughly 2,400, 50 times 50 is 2,500 or so, but it's 2,400 something ohms. And uh, that should be uh, essentially flat over frequency. Well, how do I determine if the one I built actually works? Well, one way of doing it is putting a 2,400 ohm low resistor across the, uh, the uh, output of the uh, uh, NFED transformer and uh, attach the vector network analyzer to the input. Now, something to be careful about here, remember that I've calibrated the vector, vector network analyzer, excuse me why I kill a mosquito here, there we go. <laughs> and the, um, the vector network analyzer can be calibrated in lots of different ways. I can calibrate it right here by applying my short open load right at the output port of the network analyzer, but that doesn't take into account this little piece of coax that I attached. If I had, for example, 20 feet of coax before I reached my antenna, I wanna take out all the effects of that coax. So what you wanna do is with a network analyzer, you wanna find what's called the measurement plane. The plane at which the measurement that you're making is exactly the impedance that you wanted to uh, discover. So for example, in this case, the measurement plane is right at the input port to the uh, NFED transformer. So when I calibrate this, I put a short circuit here. I put an open circuit here. I put a load here. I don't put it at the network analyzer itself, but I put it past the coax before it's attached to my device under test. And this is true in general, that I want to take out the effects of all the things that occur prior to the device I'm trying to measure. So in this case, um, I've calibrated from three megahertz to 30 megahertz. I attached a 2400 ohm resistor through a piece of wire to across the output of my NFED and I measure the S11 parameter again. And you can see that the SWR is pretty good. It's, it's less than two to one uh, over that three to 30 megahertz, which tells me that this is really a fairly decent uh, 49 to one transformer. The thing that you'll note here is that the impedance starts to rise as I hit 30 megahertz. Why is that? Well, there are a couple of effects that occur. 
One is that the core of material that's used inside the NFED is magnetic material. It has a frequency response to it. And that frequency response starts to taper off above 30 megahertz. So some of the effects that you're seeing here are due to the uh, effects of the toroidal material that's used to wrap the wires around inside here. The other part of that is corresponds to the inductance of this little piece of wire that I've got. So ideally what I wanna do is to get rid of this, this inductance. I wanna use a very flat braid of cable here. I didn't do that. There is small amount of inductance that exists. And when I multiply that at 30 megahertz, I can get quite a few ohms of impedance. And you'll see that this curve tends to rise with frequency. If I measured this at 50 megahertz, I'd be way over here somewhere. So I've gotta be careful on how I make my measurements. Not only do I have to calibrate the VNA carefully, but any kind of measurement I make has to take into account the parasitic uh, effects of inductances, capacitances, and things of that nature. Here's another use for the vector network analyzer. This is a two port device. Actually, it's a three port device because there are, there are well, let me take that back. It's actually a four port device because there's an input port. There's a port that um, is uh, here from um, uh, 500 to, uh, I think, so, excuse me, 800 to uh, 1300 megahertz. There's a port here from 300 to 500. And there's a port here from 1.8 to to uh, 200 to 300 megahertz. So this is the two meter port. This is a 70 centimeter port. And this is the 23 centimeter port. And what I did here was I applied the vector network analyzer to the input. I put my measurement plane here where I measured my short open load. And then I terminated the two unused ports with 50 ohms and measured the uh, through uh, energy going from port one, which is here, to port two. So I'm measuring S21 by attaching the network, network analyzer input, or excuse me, output from port one to the input of my uh, diplexer or triplexer here, and the output from the port I want to measure to port two on my vector network analyzer. And then what I did was I then applied 50 ohms. Once I measured the two meter response, which is this response here, I then applied 50 ohms to the two meter port and opened the 70 meter port attached to that, a 70 centimeter port attached that to port two, and I got this result here. So what you'll see is the, uh, the effects of the diplexer. You'll see that there is about a 50 dB suppression of the 70 centimeter energy into the two meter port, 53 dB into the 70 centimeter port from the two meter port. It turns out the manufacturer specifies minus 55. So, I'm a little bit off. The question is, how, why am I a little bit off? Well, primarily dynamic range limits. Um, we're talking about a $50 device. If I measured this on a $10,000 network analyzer, I, I do a lot better, but this is awfully good for 50 bucks. I can at least know whether or not my diplexer is working or my triplexer is working. I may be a few dB off here. It's actually a little bit better than 50 dB. I measure this on another network analyzer and it's about 57 dB. So this has to do with the noise floor of the vector network analyzer that I use. Another example, here's another two port device where I have one input port, another output port, and these are ceramic resonator filters. Uh, these are resonant at uh, about uh, 400 and, and, well, actually they're designed for 500 kilohertz. They're 500 kilohertz ceramic resonators. Uh, they cost about, I think I bought 500 for five bucks. So they were one penny a piece. Uh, someone got rid of those put a couple of capacitors on there and now I've got a filter design and I can measure that filter design by looking at S21 on the uh, network analyzer. Uh, I apply the, uh, the measurement port. You can see my two measurement planes here. There are actually two of them now because I've got not only an input port but I've got an output port. So when I make the measurements on a nano, I have to make sure I put a short open load here but I also have to take into account this cable when I measured it through by attaching port one to port two. Here's another example of using the network analyzer for determining crystal parameters. Um, you remember that the S11 parameter is directly related to the impedance of the device across the terminals. So here I've got a crystal 
that I put into a test fixture. And all this is doing is measuring, I've got a little bit of padding resistance here uh, for uh, the input and output. But what this is doing is measuring the impedance of the crystal as a function of frequency. And what you'll find is by looking at the real and imaginary ports, uh, parts of S11, or converting S11 into impedance and measuring the resistive part and the, uh, the, uh, in, the uh, um, a reactive part of the impedance, I end up with these two curves. Here is the resistive part, and here is the curve that represents the reactive part. Notice that at resonance, there's a huge transition that occurs where the reactive part uh, uh, goes through the zero point. So it goes from a, a capacitive reactance, which is negative uh, reactance here, to a positive reactance on this end. And it passes through zero right at the resonant frequency of the crystal. So if I want to look in my junk box and I got a, a, a half a dozen crystals that I have no idea what they are, I can easily attach them directly across the output of the vector network analyzer, measure S11 and look at the impedance uh, of the uh, crystal. And at the, re the resonant frequency, you'll see this happen. There will actually, you'll see two resonant frequencies, a series resonance and a parallel, parallel resonance. I didn't show them both here, but uh, you'll, you'll see that happen uh, on the uh, crystal resonator. Once I know these frequencies, there's a really interesting way of determining all the parameters of the crystal. Um, here are some references to, to that. But essentially what you do is you put a, a known capacitor in series with the crystal. Uh, you put three different capacitors, actually two different capacitors and just a short here, and you measure the, uh, the crossover on each case. When I have those three values, I can determine all the parameters of the crystal itself, and I can use those in a program to determine a crystal filter design. So for example, in the previous, uh, view graph, I had a crystal that I measured the motional inductance, the motional capacitance, and the parallel capacitance of in that little test fixture using my nano VNA. And uh, that allows me to plug it into this uh, crystal ladder filter program, which can be downloaded from uh, ARRL.com. And uh, you plug in the motional parameters for your crystal. You plug in how many of them you have what kind of ripple you want, how many uh, uh, dB you want in the pass span, what you want the center frequency to be, and it'll calculate all the capacitors that are needed to uh, generate the, uh, the crystal filter that you'd like. Here's the actual one that I built and it's a uh, characteristic response. Pretty doggone good for a couple junk box crystals. And it was all done by measuring the three parameters of the uh, crystal using the vector network analyzer, plug it into a crystal ladder filter program, and then calculating from there what the uh, capacitors need to be. You can build some really nice uh, bandpass filters for single sideband and CW on any receiver that you might have. We talked about uh, amplifiers uh, earlier. Well, here's an amplifier that I picked up on eBay, a little cheap Chinese one, about 10 bucks. And uh, it was too good to be true. Uh, 50 to 400 megahertz, they reference. Uh, noise figure of 0.6 dB uh, using the, uh, uh, the gas FET that's inside, a very inexpensive gas FET. Uh, it's good for a little bit better than that noise figure. And uh, what I did here was I wanted to see what, uh, I wasn't measuring noise figure here. That's a lot more complicated. You can't do that directly with the nano, but uh, I wanted to measure its gain over frequency. So the way I did this was, I wanted to apply a signal to the input of the amplifier and look at the output on the secondary port. The problem with doing this directly is the amplifier has a lot of gain. They, they claim 20, 30 dB gain. So uh, if I do that, I could blow the output port easily by overpowering it with the signal from the input port as it's amplified through this amplifier. So I don't want to do that for two reasons. One is I could physically damage the output port. Secondly, the other reason is that I could go into the nonlinear portion of, of the uh, Wheatstone bridge and end up with results that are totally, totally meaningless. So what I did was I attached a 20 dB pad. That was roughly the gain I was expecting. So I knocked the gain down by 20 dB on the input port. I then applied the short open load 
um, measurement to this port right here. So whereas I applied a short here, open and load after the 20 dB pad, that compensates out the 20 dB pad. I put the amplifier in. I also compensated out this piece of coax uh, by uh, the through port uh, measurement. And uh, by in doing that, uh, I can directly compute the gain by measuring S21. And you can see here that the gain was roughly what they, what they told me in, in the chart that they provided on the eBay, eBay page, about 25 dB at two meters, about 10, 9 dB at uh, uh, 2.3 gigahertz. Not bad for 10 bucks. I haven't measured the noise figure, but I, I would think that it's reasonably decent, whether it's 0.6 dB or maybe one and a half dB is uh, to be determined. Okay, that same amplifier, I uh, looked at measuring the uh, input impedance. So I took the amplifier as before, but uh, now what I did was I applied a 20 dB pad. Uh, let me see if I can get this out of my way so I can see what I'm doing. I attached the 20 dB pad to the output and applied a 50 ohm load. Um, the only reason I touched, put the 20 dB pad here is I wanted to make sure because I had a, the 50 ohm loads are only good for a very small amount of power, the ones that are supplied with a nano VNA. So I didn't want to blow that one. So I put 20 dB pad on the output. That gives me a very, very good 50 ohm load uh, to my uh, device under test. And then I just measured S11 going into the, uh, the, the uh, amplifier. And you can see it's actually pretty, pretty good. The, um, the standing wave ratio is shown here. This is the SWR. And the impedance is shown plotted on the uh, S chart or the Smith chart uh, here. And you notice that at around 227 megahertz, the, the SWR is better than two to one. You can see that very easily on the Smith chart, uh, pretty easily on the, on the SWR curve as well. But you can see that things are, are pretty nicely spaced uh, near the origin, which is what you want to see for uh, any 50 ohm system. You want to have all your impedances centered close to, close to the origin. The closer you are to origin, the closer you are to 50 ohms. Here's another interesting example of how to use the network analyzer. I, I had a piece of coax in the, in the shack and uh, it had a couple of F connectors on it. So I knew it, it had to be 75 ohms, but I wanted to see if that was really the case. So what I did was I again calibrated my, uh, my vector network analyzer uh, at that port right here. I attached a 50 ohm termination to the end of the coax and I measured the um, S11 parameter as a function of frequency. Now, the thing that's interesting about a piece of coax is that if the coax is exactly a quarter wavelength long, then it turns out that you get this relationship between the input and output impedances. So for example, if I have a load impedance that I put here and I calculate the input or I, I measure the input impedance, if the, if the line is exactly a quarter wavelength long, it will satisfy this relationship. And I can calculate the impedance of the line by the square root of the load impedance by the input impedance. So I know what the load impedance is. In this case, it's 50 ohms. Uh, I don't know what Z naught is, and I don't know what my load impedance is, but I do know that when it's, fifth, when it's a quarter wavelength, it is a exact reflection of the impedance to uh, the other side of the Smith chart. So for example, it, what you'll see is that as the line gets longer and longer or the frequency gets longer or higher and higher, the curve rotates in a circle in the Smith chart. And there's a point that's reached where it crosses the center line again. The center line of the Smith chart is purely resistive. So any, anything that falls on the center line is a pure resistance. So I know that I have a perfect quarter wave when the impedance hits the center line again. At that point, I know that that piece of coax is exactly a quarter wavelength long. Well, where did that occur? Well, it turns out that I measured that crossing at 25.9 megahertz. In other words, I increased the frequency zero to, to, to uh, 100 megahertz. And when it hit 25.9 megahertz, the impedance became purely resistive again, which means it, it was a perfect quarter wave line. At that point, I knew that I was at 25.9 megahertz. I, I measured the impedance on the vector network analyzer, it turns out to be 108 ohms. 
I plug it into this formula here, 108 times 50 square root, 73.48 ohms. And that was right where I expected it. The length of that line I measured to be 73 and a half inches. And that was supposed to be a quarter wavelength. But the free, if it was free space, in other words, if the velocity of propagation in this piece of coax was the speed of light, I should have gotten that uh, quarter wave at 40 megahertz. Instead, it was at 25.9 megahertz. So the ratio of those two frequencies is the velocity factor of the coax, which is 0.654. So from this one measurement, I measured two parameters. I measured that the impedance of that piece of coax is 73.48 ohms, and its velocity factor was 0.654. Guess what? RG59U is 73.5 ohms, and velocity factor of 0.66, right dead on. And it turns out if I looked really carefully, I saw a rubbed out RG59U on this piece of coax. So I, I proved that I, if I looked more carefully, I didn't need to do this. <laughs> uh, coaxial loss versus frequency. That same piece of coax or another piece of coax. Here I took some RG223 and I wanted to look at what its loss was versus frequency. Now, this is an example where you might have some coax that's been sitting out in the yard for 10 years, buried under the ground, and you want to figure out, is this stuff still good, or should I throw it away and buy some new coax? Well, before you buy some new coax, it's very easy to use the vector network analyzer to determine how well the coax is performing as a, in terms of loss. You cannot do this, this with standing wave ratio measurements, and for the following reason. Let's say I've got an antenna attached to a piece of coax that I, I don't know how good it is. And let's say the, the SWR is three to one at the, at the antenna. If I have a very lossy piece of coax, and let's say it's 100 feet long, it's very possible that the standing wave ratio will look like one to one at the input to the coax. And the reason is that the return loss of that coax is so large that the reflections are, are, are lost when it comes back and it looks like there are no reflections occurring, which is a standing wave ratio of one to one. But the actual standing wave ratio, wave ratio of, the, uh, of the antenna is three to one. So that, so that just tells you that you have a lossy piece of coax and you won't know that by measuring SWR. The way to measure coax is the following. If you take um, and measure S11 with a short circuit and you take the same piece of coax and measure S11 with an open circuit, then it turns out that the loss is given by this relationship here. And the reason it is, is that the, uh, the, the return energy from this, in other words, if I, if I transmit energy out from my nano VNA to my load, 100% of that energy should come back if there's a short. Same thing true, if there's an open, 100% of that energy should come back if the coax is perfectly good. If it's not good, I'm gonna end up with return loss or loss, but it's gonna be twice as big as the loss of the cable, right? Because I've got a double path. I've got one path going out, one path coming in. Now, why don't I just measure one of these? Well, it turns out that if I put a shorter open, I'll end up with a, a several reflections that occur. And you'll get a very wiggly line. If you put a short and an open and you average those, all those wiggles disappear and you end up with a pretty straight line. And what you'll see is this is the measured loss that I had on my RG223 that I measured. And this, these little red dots are the manufacturer's spec for that coax. So the coax is degraded perhaps a little bit, maybe a couple tenths of the dB. Uh, but uh, that's that's pretty uh, pretty decent measurement uh, using a very simple uh, uh, technique. Okay, so for uh, all you old timers that remember what a grid is on a tube, well, there's also gates, FET gate dip oscillators. These are designed. These are little devices that are designed to measure the resonant frequency of a circuit. So, for example, if you want to measure the inductance of a coil, you take a known capacitor, put it across the coil, measure its resonant frequency, and by using one over two pi square root of LC, uh, you can determine what the value of the coil is. You can do the same thing with the nano VNA. Remember that when I get to a uh, resonant result on the nano the impedance flips. In other words, the, the inductive part of the impedance goes through zero. You end up with a very, very sharp transition that occurs in the impedance. So if I look at the nano VNA, attach it to a, a little loop of coil that I made and loop that around an inductor, 
I can determine the resonant frequency of that inductor, or if the inductor is attached to a capacitor, the resonant frequency of that circuit. And from that, I can determine what the value of the inductor is. A very nice way of doing it. Um, if you can also do this for snooping into an area, just don't do this with power attached to your power amplifier uh, while you're snooping. Uh, you'll be sorely uh, disappointed as you uh, smoke things. So, and it's also very dangerous. So be careful with something that's open like this. Um, time domain reflectometry. This is another uh, interesting application for the nano. Uh, let's say you've got a piece of coax that's 150 feet long and suddenly your SWR goes to infinity. But you look and you can't see anything wrong with it. Where is it broken? Where did it short? Did something short? Did, it, did something run over it with a lawnmower? Uh, is there a pin in it somehow got embedded in it? Is, is, is the, did the cable break somewhere? Where did it break and uh, how bad was that? So using the nano, you can determine that as well. Um, S11, which is a measure of the reflection uh, is, is something that is uh, measured with the nano, uh, you're looking at S11 as the parameter versus uh, the, um, the uh, load impedance. Uh, so if the load impedance is infinite, you would expect the reflection to occur uh, that propagates back down the transmission line and you'd expect 100% reflection. But remember that a transmission line it takes time for the wavefront to go down the line. A transmission line can be modeled like this. A transmission line consists of some series inductance, a bunch of series inductors, and some parallel capacitance. And it's just an infinite set of these things. So each one of these inductors has got a short, has got a capacitor to ground. This, this represents, I'm having a hard time here drawing this with my one hand. There we go. So this, um, this is a, a model for the uh, co coaxial cable. And uh, as you transmit power down this coaxial cable, there's a lag that occurs due to the inductance of the wire. The wire has a finite amount of inductance. And there's also a certain amount of capacitance that exists between the center conductor and the braid of the coax. And it turns out that these parameters, these inductances per unit length and capacitances per unit length, combined with the resistive loss per unit length and the uh, loss in the uh, uh, dielectric material per unit length are what determine the characteristic impedance of the coax. But what happens is as the, as the wavefront comes down the transmission line, it gets reflected back. And you can measure those reflections using S11. The problem is S11 is in the frequency domain. In other words, it measures it versus frequency, but I wanna see it in time. I wanna see when did that occur? Was it uh, 180 nanoseconds away or was it 300 nanoseconds? Because the speed of light or, or speed of electrons in that media multiplied by the time it takes to, uh, to, to transmit down that media is the distance that's traveled. So uh, I can use for you, I won't uh, belabor this slide, but essentially what I do is I set up an excitation I measure S11, I convert S11 to the frequency, to, from the frequency domain to the time domain, and that can be done automatically on your network analyzer. And you end up with a graph like this. So I take the network analyzer. Here I've got uh, an example where I've got three and a half feet of RG8 jumper cable, and I've got an alpha delta switch. Uh, I've got 22 and a half feet of RG213, which goes out to my alpha delta coax surge protector. I've got a 73 foot run of RG213 going to my, my antennas.com transformer. And then I've got an NFED wire. So what I did was I looked at S11 going into this whole system and I converted S11 in the frequency domain to the time domain using the, that inverse Fourier transform. It's done automatically on the, uh, the software. You don't have to do the, the calculations yourself. And what you'll find is that in the time domain, you end up with a bunch of little pips that occur. This first pip, a very large pip, occurred at my alpha delta switch, which was three feet, seven inches away. I got a very, very large reflection. At about eight feet, or excuse me, eight meters away, 
I ended up with a series of reflections, which turned out to be my alpha delta coax switch and the coaxial connectors that were attached there. Some of these additional reflections are due to uh, the measurement frequency range. I won't get into that, but it's a little more complex, but you'll get a little bit of reflections there. Uh, about 30.5 meters away or about 100 feet away, which was about uh, the 73 feet plus 22 feet away, I end up with a huge reflection, which is the myantennas.com transformer. And this is my piece of coax. So if it turns out that I ended up with a big blip on my coax here, I would know that there was a discontinuity that occurred at this distance from my transmitted end to that, coax, that piece of coax, and I'll know exactly where the break is. This could be at, uh, let's say, 20.2 meters. So 20.2 20, 20, 20 meters away, I know that there's a break in my coax, and I can maybe, perhaps save at least 20 meters of coax on one side and you know, 50 meters on the other and throw away that one piece. So the time domain reflectometry is really useful. Uh, another application is uh, matching networks. Remember I said that the closer you can get to the origin of on a Smith chart, the better off you're gonna be. So how do I move something from, here's, here's a uh, antenna that is operating on uh, 160 meters, but it was designed for uh, uh, 80 meters. So I, I wanna take an 80 meter antenna and I wanna operate it at 160 meters. Well, if I just plugged it in directly, I end up with a huge SWR, which is what you'd expect. Somehow I wanna take this curve, which is the 160 meter band and move it so that it moves towards the center of the Smith chart where things are nice and hunky-dory at 50 ohms. How do I do that? Well, a couple ways. I can use series inductance. If I use series inductance, I move in this way on the Smith chart, I move, into the right in a circle. If I have uh, series capacitance, I move in the opposite direction. If I have shunt inductance, I move to the left, but upwards. And if I have shunt capacitance, I move to the left, but downwards. So by putting different elements in front of my antenna, I can compensate and move a given point from any point on the Smith chart over to the center. So if I put an inductance in there, the inductance will move uh, that curve uh, to the right uh, and upwards, or actually to the left and upwards. And then the um, capacitance will move me in this direction. Uh, excuse me, the inductance will move me in this direction, a shunt inductance, let me get this right, and will move me in that direction and the, uh, uh, shunt, the series capacitance will move me in the other direction. So what I wanna do is I wanna move that curve and uh, let's see if I can see a little bit better here. So I put 13 point, it, I, uh, here's a curve by the way, what I did in this case in order to get this curve, um, I used a program called SimSmith. What I did was I took the nano VNA and I measured S11. And on, an, on the nano VNA, there's an option to download the uh, S11 curve into what's called a touchstone file. And the touchstone file, which is a .s1p file or .s2p file, depending on the parameter you're looking at, is uh, the set of S parameters that's associated with that measurement. SimSmith will read that set of S parameters and load it directly into a Smith chart. And you'll see this, this uh, on the SimSmith program, which allows you to add all these different parameters, all these different components uh, to perform the matching. So for example, when I add this inductance here, I take this point 1.9 megahertz and I move it, so it's, a, it's a, shunt induct, uh, shunt inductance. I move it, or excuse me, a series inductance, so let me get this right. It's a series inductance and moves uh, clockwise to, to the right and upwards. And, uh, and I hit the 50 ohm uh, impedance line. And then I put a shunt inductance, which moves me upwards to the left. And I ended up a point here at the origin. So by uh, adjusting the series inductance so that I end up close to the 50 ohm curve uh, that is this curve here, and then putting a shunt inductance, which moves you along that curve to get to the origin, I get a perfect SWR at 1.9 megahertz. 
the, it's fairly sharp, but it'll work very, very well over a, a fairly small band. And I got my 80 meter antenna now working on 160 meters. Um, so um, let's look at one other thing. Uh, this is what the final, final view graph uh, for the presentation. I've got an antenna and I wanna look at what its pattern is. So if you think about a network analyzer, the network analyzer is putting out power in port zero or the S1 port, and it's receiving power in port one. Well, the power could, could go into a linear system, a linear network or antenna, but it could also go into a transmit antenna. And that power, since it's energy, it's gonna be radiated from that antenna. So if I put that energy into a transmit antenna, it'll be radiated. And if I put a receive antenna on the other side, I can pick up that energy, move it back. It's gonna be loss. It's gonna be a lot of loss because of the range loss here, but I can reamplify that up and put it back into port one. What have I just measured? I've measured S21 for that network. Well, it turns out that the relationship of the received power in this antenna here to the transmitted power from this antenna is given by this equation, which is called the freeze transmission equation. And it's related to the transmit power, the gain of the transmit antenna, the gain of the receive antenna, the wavelength and the distance. So if you look at the ratio of the received power to the transmit power, which is just S21, I end up with this relationship. And from this relationship, if I make both of these antennas identical, so for example, let's say I have two J slots, I have a J slot antenna that I'm designing. I build two of them for some frequency. I put them both together, measure S21. Now I can get the exact parameters for the gain of that antenna by compensating for the distance between the antennas. I need to choose the range so that I'm in the far field because I don't, I don't wanna have uh, problems with uh, close in, uh, 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 interference. So this equation is important. It's called the Fraunhofer distance. Uh, I want the amplifier gain to compensate for my range loss. And remember, we need to compensate that out using the nano VNA uh, calibration algorithm. And the thing that's interesting is I can build a frequency, uh, the antenna at a higher frequency and scale everything. So if I want to build, for example, a, a two meter beam, uh, say a seven element two meter beam. I don't need to be, build two versions of my two meter, seven meter beam. I can build a one gigahertz version of it, much, much smaller and compact, build two small uh, one gigahertz beams, put them on the network analyzer, determine the gain, and the gain is gonna stay the same versus frequency uh, by this equation here, uh, but it's the um, it can be uh, compensated for um, uh, the element sizes are compensated for by just scaling them according to the ratio of the model frequency to the design frequency. Okay, so in, in summary, and I, I, I uh, realize this was a lot of stuff to cram in, in a short, a short uh, hour plus. Uh, in the past, the vector network analyzers were, were primarily used uh, in the lab for VHF and higher frequencies where it was very difficult to measure voltage and current. It's easy to measure reflections. It's very difficult to measure voltages and currents on, uh, on transmission lines, um, and primarily due to stray reactances. The problem with the vector network analyzers in the past until maybe a couple of years ago is they were in the four to five figure number. You could literally, my first house, uh, was uh, the same cost as the network analyzer I had to buy for work. <laughs> so they're, they're not cheap the, the, uh, you know, devices. Um, but when you can get them for 50 bucks, it, it, it's a total uh, change in, in, uh, in uh, what you can do. Um, the network analyzer measures incident reflected waves, like I mentioned. Uh, the um, Important thing is to get a good understanding of the Smith chart. And one of these days I'd like to give a little presentation on the Smith chart and coaxial cables. I think that would be interesting too as well. But the, um, the thing is there are a lot of things you can use it for. Uh, low cost microwave frequency synthesizer design was what's used in these devices. You can measure one port and two port parameters, measure things like cable losses, cable shorts, uh, amplifier gains, uh, amplifier uh, 
uh, pram, uh, uh, amplifier patterns, uh, uh, excuse me, antenna patterns, uh, standing wave ratios, what have you. So here are some references for you. Like I said, this is going to be on my website. I'll give you a link to that in a second. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, uh, the copies of you can just go to this site here. You don't need to add, type this rest of the stuff in. Uh, go to ak3y.com. You'll find not only the uh, this presentation, but you'll find all the resources associated with it, all the software for the Nano VNA, a, a really nice uh, copy of a Smith chart that you can you can print out for yourself, very high resolution, and uh, some more uh, uh, discussions of the the Nano VNA. So thank you, thank you very much. Let me see how do I quit here. Uh, I think I, I did. I quit my sharing. Yes, you did. Okay, We're back yeah. to the normal. Okay. Right. Well, great. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay, um, so now, are you, can you have time to take a couple of questions? Sure. All right. Hands All up right. here, Hank. <laughs> yeah, Hank. Hi, um, it, th this is very interesting. In fact, you took my fear of Smith's charts away because now I understand them much, much better. And the other thing was that um, where were these nano VNAs around when we had TDRs where we were looking for losses in coaxial cables or trying to detect where faults occurred? And I guess at, at that time, TDRs and your network analyzers in the lab probably cost the same. But today, it can, you would use a, a nano VNA as a, or you could or can use it as a TDR? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, that's what I did there. The little nano VNA uh, that I showed you um, was hooked up to my uh, uh, NFED antenna system. And from that, you can you can measure all the parameters. You can tell you, I, I could tell exactly how much coax I had between my uh, antenna switch and my uh, lightning arrestor. I could tell the distance from the lightning arrestor to my uh, NFED transformer. And if I went further out, I could actually tell you how long my NFED was. Uh, I just didn't go out far enough. Uh, so very useful. The reason uh, to answer your question, Hank, why weren't these things around? A couple things happened. Uh, a few years ago, the SI5351 synthesizer chip uh, became very, very uh, popular and low cost. And a couple other synthesizer chips as well uh, popped onto the marketplace. Uh, when I say low cost, I mean like $2 uh, for a complete synthesizer. Um, in addition to that, the uh, microcontrollers uh, have gotten very, very low cost. A couple dollars for a microcontroller now that just blows the socks off of what you had 10 years ago. And the big uh, change for the nano VNA was that audio signal processing chip. Uh, it was a few years old, but it was a very unique design that these guys came up with. They uh, heterodyned to a baseband as opposed to heterodyning to an IF strip. And then you were doing all the stuff with complex uh, uh, high speed A to D converters at IF. They went directly to baseband and they used an audio signal processing chip that could measure amplitude and phase very accurately. And that was the game changer. That was a few dollars. And now you ended up with a, a complete design that I got to believe uh, they're selling it for $50, $60. I got to believe that they, they, they're making these for five to six bucks total. Okay, well, that, that, that's a, a, a good answer regarding my sarcastic question about <laughs> why these things weren't well, around. But right. the, the, the other part, when you're doing those measurements, uh, is that simply a visual mm -hmm. uh, indication and readout on the uh, VNA where you input uh, the type of coax you have, like uh, you know whether it's an RG8 or say an LD50 uh, or something where you know the velocity factors for the coax involved. And then that would be about all you would need then to get those parameters to where those faults occurred, I take it. Yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. The, the way the uh, time domain reflectometry works, uh, remember S11 is a measure of reflection. So if, if I apply a signal to a piece of coax, it propagates down this, the piece of coax at the velocity factor of that coax. 
bounces off whatever discontinuity or impedances uh, at the end, that it, that's a mismatched impedance. If everything was matched, you get no reflection back. That's the whole purpose of, of doing this is to find where those uh, uh, really imperfections are since they're not 50 ohms. Um, and that comes back. The, the, the S11 is measured in the frequency domain, but, it, but it, it's, you can measure it from DC to let's say a couple of gigahertz. Well, if you take that, that same frequency domain response and inverse Fourier transform it, that converts the frequency domain into the time domain. Uh, the time domain response then, uh, the, the, the uh, ability to measure uh, the fineness in time is proportional to how wide a frequency domain response you got. So in other words, if I, if I measure things out to five gigahertz, I, I'm good to 200 picoseconds in time resolution uh, in, in the time domain because it's reciprocal of each other. Uh, so one over five gigahertz gives me 200 picoseconds. Um, now, in the, uh, once you've done that, so you've converted S11 into time, then where reflection occurs corresponds to a blip in the time domain response. And that blip occurs at so many nanoseconds or picoseconds out from the transmit signal. In order to determine where it's located physically, I need to know how fast the electrons got there. Because like in the case that I showed you, I had a piece of RG8 coax, which has a very different velocity factor than my RG213. Uh, and then the RG, RG213 has a different, different velocity factor than my uh, piece of wire that is attached to my NFED. The NFED velocity factor is like 0.95. The uh, RG213 was like 0.66, and the RG8 was like 0.69 or something like that. So taking into account those velocity factors, I can then compensate for uh, what those time representations are in terms of distance, and then I get all the, you know, all the locations of where all those discontinuities are. Okay. All right. Well, so thank Bob, you very much. Yeah. So, Bob, you have a couple more questions. I don't mean to interrupt, but we have no, a no, couple please. more people. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, Bob, uh, W3DK, over to you. Thank you. Hi, this is Bob, W3DK. Um, Bob, great presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you, do you, would you recommend a source for one of these things? And there's something called a nano VNA H4. Is that a recommended one? Yeah, there's there's a, a couple things that uh, you have to take into account, uh, Bob. One is that the uh, the, the nano VNA that uh, was uh, uh, that first came out, uh, which uh, was uh, shoot, I can't remember the guy's name uh, that did it. He had uh, it was uh, out of um, uh, China, uh, I believe it was out of Taiwan. But it, to make a long story short. What happened was they, he designed this and he uh, made all the, uh, uh, the schematics and the software public domain. In doing so, uh, he ended up with uh, zillions of clones that occurred. Some of the clones are very good. Some of them are very bad. Um, and people have been knocking off uh, some really bad versions. The H4 is a very good version. So if you get a real H4, and I'll get you some, um, if you pop me an email, I'll get you the, uh, the good sources for all these things. Okay. Um, but the, uh, the H4, uh, if, if it's a original H4 is a very, very nice nano. The, the other one that I didn't talk about much, and I used it in my presentation, which I, I didn't refer to it, was the SAA2N. Um, nano VNA. And uh, the SAA2N is, um, actually there's the SAA2, there's a, the SAA2N uh, refers to N connectors. There's also an SMA connector version and there may actually be a, 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 a PL or a, a UHF connector version as well, but the SAA-2, that is based on a different architecture. The, um, the nano VNA H4 is based on the SI5351 uh, synthesizer chip, and it uses the multiplications of that chip's oscillator frequency to uh, generate responses up to uh, three gigahertz. Um, there are uh, negatives to do that. The, the main negative is dynamic range gets lost every time you multiply up. So from DC to 300 megahertz, you get a reasonably good dynamic range. When you multiply that by a factor of two, it, it drops when you multiply, et cetera. 
The SAA2 uh, does not do that. It uses a very different architecture. It does not use frequency multiplication. As a consequence, I'm getting between 10 and 20 dB more dynamic range out of it. It's also made more rugged. I'll get you a link to that or anybody would like a link. I'll, I'll try to put that on my website to, to, to make everybody available. Uh, and that one I use uh, for more precise measurements if I need the higher dynamic range. The little guy is just nice because it, it's so compact. It's the other one is uh, maybe about three times bigger in terms of thickness uh, and uh, maybe one and a quarter times uh, larger in X and Y dimensions. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is Tom. And uh, I wanted to know, do you know if there's any kind of like Coursera classes that would be on like Smith's charts, transmission lines, velocity factors, you know, like that? I'm not familiar with Coursera, but I know that uh, W2 uh, AEW, um, uh, should I can't remember his name now, but uh, he's got a lot of YouTube channel videos. They're relatively simple on the Smith chart, um, but they're, they're good to get started. Uh, I also gave uh, some references. There's a reference in my presentation to Smith chart from Roden Schwartz. Uh, Roden Schwartz has a series of uh, video presentations on the use of uh, the vector network analyzer and also on the, view, on the use of Smith charts. Um, it, it's, it, it's somewhat superficial, but it's great starting material for using Smith charts. And uh, you'll uh, also find some uh, view graphs, or excuse me, some presentations on using Smith charts for matching networks. I would love, Alex, uh, maybe in the future to give a presentation on Smith charts and how to use them. Uh, also on uh, cables, uh, coaxial cables. There's, there's so much uh, material there. You could have another session, but uh, it's an interesting, uh, ba basically with a Smith chart, just uh, in summary, uh, Tom, was the Smith chart was a, a means of warping the impedances that you see on a transmission line uh, to the unit circle. So uh, when you did that, it turns out that things like moving along a transmission line was a simple rotation on the Smith chart and everything became graphic. In other words, if I moved along a Smith chart, I knew, uh, so many wavelengths along, I knew exactly where I were in, in impedance because the Smith chart, I could follow it as a circle along the impedance uh, uh, curves that were there. Uh, Smith was brilliant. It was a really uh, a brilliant transformation. And uh, it's, uh, it's worth its weight in gold to give you a, a view of, of how your circuit is performing. Okay. All right, are there any more questions? All right, well, Bob, thank you so much. What a terrific presentation. It's You're nice of you to us. join us and to, and to uh, put in the time to, uh, to give us, you know, just wonderful information. One last question for uh, Bob. What was your website that we need to visit? Uh, it's difficult, ak3y.com. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I went to the wrong site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ak3y.com will get you, get you to there. Uh, there's, a, there's the information on the previous presentation I gave on the Arduino. And uh, there's also the NanoVNA stuff. There's a lot of material on NanoVNA that you'll find there, Hank, that uh, may be useful.